The next speaker will be uh, our guest from Great UK. We have, we have two Roberts, <coughs> Professor Robert. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen. Um, that's as much Russian as I'm going to speak. Um, I, I prefer to do my talk in English. It will be easier for me. It will be easier for you. Um, uh, I want to start by saying that um, I read your program, the program note for this forum, An Economy for Human Beings, with great interest and much agreement. In fact, I hope you, you have had a chance to read it because it's very good. My criticism concerns one important omission, which um, uh, I will refer to at the end. Um, I, the document is a slashing attack on the present postulates of economic policy based on what it calls radical liberalism, market fundamentalism, neoclassical orthodoxy. And much of this is uh, familiar in the West. It's echoed in the West. But uh, this wrong economic policy is held to be responsible, largely responsible for the defects of Russia's post-communist experience. The program note, and again I'm referring to the document, calls for more active role for the state in economic development. Essentially a third way uh, between the state and the market, which at one point it calls the Scandinavian model, uh, but it also draws on Brazil and other Latin American countries. For example, it says that the share of gross domestic product re redistributed by the state should reach 50%. The authors of the document discuss the diversity of property relationships. They advocate state-led innovation, private-public partnerships, development of civil society. Parasitic consumption should be replaced by qualitative and not quantitative measures of welfare. Parasitic finance should be curtailed, and so on. Then economics should be made less mathematical and its imperial ambitions should be reduced. Now, I endorse most of this, I agree with most of this, and have preached much of this doctrine uh, at home in, in the United Kingdom. For example, I've been uh, a consistent critic of the doctrines of budgetary austerity in face of the slump whose shaky theoretical foundations derive from simplified neoclassical economics. I agree completely with the need for new banking, stronger banking regulations. I mean, that's, that's been dramatized just now by the crisis in Cyprus. Uh, it was in 2004 that uh, Franz Munterfering, then chairman of the Social Democratic Party in Germany, called financiers irresponsible locust swarms who measure success in quarterly intervals, suck off substance, and let companies die once they have eaten them away. At the time, this was simply regarded as left, a left-wing criticism. Now, it's more generally accepted. Um, I would be much bolder on banking reform than this paper, which only calls for a Tobin tax. I think uh, that you need to uh, not only strengthen liquidity and uh, capital adequacy ratios, you need to separate out commercial from investment banking. You need a more competitive banking system, and you also need a cap on banking bonuses. Um, you know, nothing has so diminished 
public respect for private enterprise in recent years than the huge sums of money being paid for financial activities, many of which strike the public as pure waste. I agree further that economics <coughs> is not the same as physics. Most of its propositions are not true universally, but only in context, and I am speaking as an economist. It's, it suffers from the Ricardian vice of ab, uh, excessive abstraction. Now, I'm on the advisory council of, uh, a, of a foundation started by George Soros called INET, Institute for New Economic Thinking. And Russian economists should take an interest in this organization and bring a Russian perspective to bear on what's now largely an American-dominated undertaking. I'm not much in favor of fixing a percentage of national income to be spent by the state. I think that's not right. Much more important is to distinguish between current and capital spending. The first should cover necessary social expenditure and should always be paid for by taxation. The second, state investment spending, should be covered by borrowing, just as private, uh, private firms borrow or, or raise equity to invest. I would be careful um, about private-public partnerships. Um, it's a good idea. A public-private partnership differs from simple private sector and simple public sector provision in two ways. It's based on sharing risk between the public sector and the private sector, but secondly, effective private-public partnerships align the interests of private uh, firms and the government. So it's quite a nice um, idea conceptually, um, but, but um, it depends on uh, how the risks are divided, and it also depends crucially on um, having an efficient um, and honest private sector and an efficient and honest government. And that brings me to my last point, um, which is uh, the last omission of the forum's document. It leaves out the whole question of political risk. It assumes a state which, in its own words, represents the interests of society as opposed to private people that represent their own interests. But that's not the state which Russia has today, unfortunately. Russia today is neither a state, status, or a market economy. It's an inefficient mixture of the two, in which it's impossible to disentangle the state from a network of private interests. Um, uh, any, any development strategy, whether statist or market, um, uh, uh, um, any, um, falls foul of the way in which the Russian state actually works, which sociologist Alyona Lyedineva has called the Putin system. She starts with the observation that the 20 most powerful people in Russia today were all either KGB colleagues of the president or come from the St. Petersburg mayor's office where uh, President Putin worked from 1989. The system she describes consists of three elements. This is very academic. I'm not making a political point here. The system she describes consists of three elements. First, a profusion of personalized networks, which leaves institutions undeveloped. Second, a distribution of resources through these networks rather than through market mechanisms, the benefit going to those who adapt and benefit uh, and, 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 and can manipulate the blurred lines between public and private, the chinovniki businessmeni and abarotni pogona. Uh, and thirdly, lack of checks and balances because of the passivity of the people, dependence of the judiciary on the state, lack of information, lack of information, very important, and the weakness of civil society. 
Now, to get a coherent development program of the kind in this document, um, it would be very difficult um, out, to, out of this system. But in addition, there has been no real incentive um, to, for reform as long as the commodity boom continued. So you have inherent defects in the system and then lack of incentive as long as um, uh, energy prices continue to rise. So the program of economic reform is conditional on political reform. Otherwise, it's just a set of aspirations doomed to continuous disappointment.